Well, welcome once again to Calvary Baptist Church. This is Wednesday, May 13th, 2020, and this is our midweek message for the week, and we're going to be looking uh, this afternoon, this evening, at Judges chapter 6. So if you want to get your Bible and turn to the book of Judges, we're going to be looking uh, briefly at the first few verses and then uh, looking more in depth at the last few verses in between verses 14 and 16. So um, get your Bible, Judges chapter 6. There is a discussion about whether the times make men or men make the times. In other words, are great people the result of the environment they find themselves in or do environments um, do they do do environments make the men? In other words, do the times call forth those attributes in certain individuals that pose for greatness, or do those people shape their environment? Well, maybe maybe it's a combination of both, from a, especially from a secular standpoint. But I would say that God makes people for the situations that God calls them to. This was certainly true of a man that we are looking at in the book of Judges, chapter 6. So I would invite you to turn there, if you're not already there, to the book of Judges, chapter 6. We're going to look at the life of one of the judges of Israel, a man by the name of Gideon. Now we find that Gideon lived in an oppressive environment uh, during uh, a very, very bad time in Israel's history. In verse 1 of chapter 6, it says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. Now, this was a captivity, one of the many captivities that the children of Israel found themselves in the book of Judges. And this this oppressive environment they found them in, themselves in was the result of their own backsliding. They, they were regressive. Uh, the, that is the, the pattern with the Israelites, especially in the book of Judges. They would get right with God and then they would be, then they would backslide against God, start worshiping the false gods and the nations, and then God would la, la, allow a hostile uh, nation to uh, either captivate them or go to war with them, oppress them in some way. Uh, the children of Israel, verse 1, did evil in the sight of the Lord. They began to worship false gods. Scripture uh, tells us in chapter 6 and verse 10, I said unto you, God says to them, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. So they had embraced falsehood and the practices of those nations around them, and had a very um, repressive result. The Lord, verse 7 tells us, delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years, um, or verse 1 tells us that. So, um, this disobedience on their part had consequences. God delivered them into the hand of Midian. And uh, the result of that, I mean, verses 2 through 6 basically tell us the results of that turning over to the, the nation of the Midianites. There was certainly um, uh, very, very depressed circumstances. If you look at verse 2, for instance, uh, they they had to resort, the Israelites had to resort to re occlusive living, the land, excuse me, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens, which are in the mountains, and caves, and strongholds. In other words, they had to forsake the valleys and go to the mountain areas where they, and they became cavemen. Uh, they were secluded. They couldn't go about freely. They had to stay there. Kind of reminds you of the environment we're kind of in right now with this uh, quarantine, but uh, this was uh, this was their lifestyle. They became reclusive. 
they were exploited economically. Look at verse 3. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. So notice what it says, when they had sown, meaning that they had planted their crops and uh, were going to you know, harvest them. These people came up and either took the crops themselves or they destroyed them. They burned them. And then uh, they took their cattle, their sheep, uh, their oxen, uh, their donkeys, and so on. So there was, uh, they had forced them out of the, the valleys, the fertile valleys, and into the, into the rocky hill country and took their crops, took their sheep, took their uh, oxen and their donkeys, which would be the equivalent of taking a farmer's tractors or uh, taking your car. You couldn't go anywhere. Uh, you couldn't go, get, go to the grocery store and, and pick up things because your car or your donkey had been confiscated. So uh, they were in very, very negative, oppressive uh, circumstances and impress, oppressive environment. But then you see that the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Verse 7 says, they cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites. Now, their crying to God was directly as a result of their oppressors. Uh, it was directed toward or motivated by their oppressive oppressors. They cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites. Their attention was centered upon the Midianites. But I want us to see that God redirects their attention and sent them a prophet, verse 8, and redirected their attention toward their own responsibility to him. Notice it says, The Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drave them out from before you, and gave you their land. God reminds them of their own ingratitude to him. This is what I've done for you. And verse 10, he talks about not only their ingratitude, but their rebellion against God, uh, where he says, And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. They had started assuming the worship and the lifestyle of the Canaanites uh, that dwelt in the land. Now, we, we're not told exactly how that in this passage, how that took place. It could have taken place through intermarriage. Uh, quite often, uh, somebody uh, adopts the religious faith of the one uh, that they married to, at least in name. And sometimes it's very shallow profession, but they'll, they'll do that in order to keep peace. And maybe it's through intermarriage. It might have just happened over time. And God confronts them with this, confronts the nation. First, you, you've been ungrateful because I was the one that brought you into this land, preserved you from the Egyptians and so on. And this is, this is the way you respond. And then they had rebelled against him. So why does God confront his people with these two things, their ingratitude and their rebellion? He confronts them because they needed to own it. They needed to own their disobedience. They were crying out because of the consequences. God sent them a preacher to tell them the reason that they were being that these consequences that they were they were bemoaning was the result of their own sin against God. The problem was them. Owning one's responsibility in the face of consequences is hard. We want to blame others. We want to blame the circumstances. The last place we want to fix culpability on is on ourselves. The history of humanity is casting is one of casting blame and refusing to accept responsibility. Self-justification is the default setting of the selfish soul. A century ago, ago the newspaper, The Times of London, asked a writer, a philosopher by the name of G.K. Chesterton, asked him to write an essay on the topic, What is Wrong with the World? And he wrote two words. The words, I am. Listen, too often, we don't want to admit 
that the consequences that we are facing are the direct result of our choices. And God's people uh, cried out, God responded, but he responded by redirecting their attention to themselves. Someone said God judges rebellion, but he accommodates weakness. And in this case, when when they admitted, they apparently did own their sin as a, a, a nation because God sent them a deliverer in the form of a person by the name of Gideon. Uh, God sent them an unlikely deliverer. Now notice, as we move on, uh, in verse 11, there came an angel of the Lord who sat on, under an oak which was in Ophrah, the, that pertained unto Joash the Abrezrite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. He had taken, uh, taken his wheat and was throwing it up in the air to let the chaff blow out and to have pure grain in back of a wine press, uh, to, uh, in, in, so it wouldn't be obvious to the Midianites. Verse 12 says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now, here is Gideon's response. And I want, you to, want us to really note this. Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befalling us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Now I want you to see here a man of wounded faith. He's questioning uh, the presence of God. God had just said, The Lord is with you. But he said, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why is all this happened? He questioned the presence of God. He was perplexed by the inaction of God. And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of? And he's dubious about the faithfulness of God. This is a man of wounded faith. He says, But now the Lord hath forsaken us. His conclusion was that God has written us off. He is done with me and us. You ever been tempted to say similar things to God? God, where have you been? Why, why did you let this happen? You don't really care. We don't say these kinds of things when times are good. We tend to say these things when life gets rough. I was reading an article by uh, a man by the name of Nate, Nate Pyle, and he said this. He said, it's only a matter of time before life falls apart. The loss of a job, a diagnosis of cancer, an unfaithful spouse, abuse from a leader, the betrayal of a dear friend. It doesn't matter how suburban our lives are at the moment. If we haven't already, we'll all come face to face with the tragic. Suffering is the common human experience. And then Nate goes on to say this. He said, the truth is you cannot know how wide and deep your faith runs until life falls apart. We have every reason to place faith in a good and loving God when life is blessed. We have every reason to trust God's goodness when our marriage is intimate, our bank accounts full, our health present, and our kids flourishing. Yet our faith, if left untested during these times, uh, when it's left untested, is easy to believe that God is in control when life is full of joy. It's when the semi-charmed sheen rubs off our suburban lives that we begin asking the questions. Doubts creep in from the back of our mind when the medical bills stack up. Feelings of abandonment gnaw at us when our child lies in a hospital bed. When the doctor declares there's nothing else they can do for our loved one, it can feel as though faith, our faith is too weak to sustain us. Now, folks, we're not told what Gideon's faith in God was like before these circumstances. But when the trouble came, we know what he started to say. And it indicated a man with wounded faith. But there's something more. It's a man who viewed himself as worthless. Look at um, uh, verse 14. And God says to him, uh, The Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? And he, Gideon, said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. God says, I've chosen you to go. What was his response? Well, certainly uh, if, uh, what he said lacked, uh, revealed a lack of self-confidence. 
O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Now, what was the basis of that? Behold, my family is poor, and I'm the least in my father's house. He said, I have no influence at all to lead Israel into, into victory against the Midianites. My family is poor. Money, even in our society, money equals influence. Money equals importance. Money equals power. I'm continually amazed that uh, actors, Hollywood actors, are testifying in front of Congress as if their success or their notoriety or their wealth imbues their opinion with some kind of importance. I'm, I, I'm really shocked that, that it is like people like Bill Gates that are having the kinds of influence they have simply because they have a lot of money. But the idea is, is that money and influence go together. If you are rich, then somehow you are more important than someone else. That is what Gideon was saying. I am, my family is poor in the tribe of Manasseh. In other words, he was part of a, a, one of the tribes, the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel. But he said they were poor even within their tribe. My family's poor. And not only that, but he was the least individual within his family. I am the least in my father's house. He is telling God that he does not have the wherewithal or the influence or the importance to change, change or do anything. He is telling God, no one's going to listen to me. I'm not anybody. I don't matter. I don't count. I'm not important. I'm not a leader because the social con constructs of our my society say that I'm not important. And I believe that. I'm not important. I'm not even important in my own family. I'm nobody. So here he was. His faith was wounded, certainly. But he was a man who viewed himself as, as worthless. His confidence was non-existent. His self-worth was bankrupt. His self-respect was shattered. His self-regard was minimal. His sense of worth was, for lack of a word, he had none. So, here were the two things about Gideon. But this was the man whom God would use. And I want you to see how God described this man. He hails him as a mighty man of valor. Um, scripture uh, tells us that he is addressed that way. Hail thou mighty man of valor. I'm trying to see where the, the exact verse uh, where it says that. In, um, yes, in verse 12, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now, he, sir, he was hiding from the Midianites. Did he look like a mighty man of valor? Did he, did he pretend like he was being a mighty man of valor? No. In fact, in his mind, he was none of those things. But God calls him a mighty man of valor, and he was what God said he was, regardless of how he thought he was. So, and not only that, but he, God tells him, the Lord is with you. So, he was one with whom the presence of God was upon and was one whom God had chosen. Now, he hadn't yet realized his, his potential, uh, but he was still what God said he was. Crucial to remember that. And that God had a destiny prescribed for him. Verse 14, go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the Midianites. Have not I sent you? Verse 16, note what it says there. And the Lord said unto him, surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Gideon, according to God, possessed the, the capacity and the capability uh, to lead Israel and destroy the Midianites as if they were only one individual. You'll, just, you'll defeat all of them as one man. Now, Gideon didn't believe that at the time, but it was true nonetheless. God prescribed his identity. He was a mighty man of valor, and God prescribed his destiny that he was going to lead the children of Israel. 
He had the leadership ability and the capability and the calling to do exactly what God had said. The defeat of all the Midianites is going to happen by you, Gideon. That was the truth. Gideon didn't yet grasp it. But it was true nonetheless. Listen, we need to, to take our identity, not about what we our feelings tell us we are, not about what our social construct says that we are, not by what someone else says you are. I remember talking to a lady years ago who told about how her entire life that her mother told her she was worthless that she wished that she hadn't been born, that she preferred boys over girls. And so this lady told me how she carried that idea all of her life that she really didn't matter. Listen, it doesn't matter what some human being says about you. It doesn't matter if you've been run down by others or even in society, if you're one of the upper crust of society. It is not what society thinks about you. It is what God thinks about you. Now listen. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ personally, if you've come to the place where you've recognized yourself a sinner and that you cannot earn or, uh, or uh, in any way merit your acceptance with God, but that God through Christ gave himself on the cross for you to, to be your substitute for your sin and your punishment, to grant you forgiveness and everlasting life. If you've come to a personal trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. What does that make you? Well, my Bible tells me that it makes you a child of God. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26 says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8 verse 15, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be, we suffer with him that we might be glorified together. What he is saying in these passages of Scripture, that our identity as people in this world, if you know Christ as Savior, is that you are a child of God. Not only that, but I am an heir of God a joint heir with Jesus. You are a child of God. And then there's another thing that you are, whether you think about it or not, but you are already a winner. You are already a conqueror. Romans chapter 8, verse 37 says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. More than conquerors. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57 says, But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We already are the victor. Now, I, I know what happens. I know what happens in my own life, especially when I uh, fail to live up to, to the, the standards that, that uh, I know God's word has for uh, not just Christians, but for pastors in, in particular. Uh, I, sometimes I feel defeated. But I have to remind myself that my own failure was the reason that Jesus had to come in the first place. My inability to live up to that holy standard that God has is the whole reason why Christ had to come in the first place. And that through my faith in Christ, I have been adopted into God's family, and I am one of God's adopted children. And friend, so are you. And you need to remind yourself of that. By the way, that position of being a child of God, accepted in the beloved, as the scripture says, has nothing to do with performance. It has nothing to do with family backgrounds. It has nothing to do with your personal achievements. It has to do with God's grace and the personal work of Christ. You are a child of God. You are a conqueror. And you can do anything that God calls and equips you to do. God had already established that Gideon was a mighty man of valor. Did he feel like that? No. Did he think of himself that way? No. Did he have any life experience that told him that? No. But God had already prescribed that that's exactly who he was. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13 says this, I can do all things through Christ 
which strengtheneth me. There have been many times when I have thought about certain tasks that I had to do that I am I thought to myself, I am not equipped to do this. And yet I've been had to remind myself as well, did God call me to this? Did he call me to do this work? And the answer would be yes. Did he did he have me facing this situation in his sovereign plan for my life? And the answer is yes. Then he has equipped me to do that. Listen. If you believe that you're a child of God, if you believe that you're more than a conqueror, and if you believe that God, uh, whom God calls, he also equips to do what he wants him to do. If you believe those three things, then uh, you're in good stead, you're in good order. This was what Gideon failed to believe initially. Let me tell you, as we close, there was a boy that was raised in a large family in East Tennessee. This was a family that scorned education as being a waste of time. Virtually no one in their family, in fact, I think not just virtually, but no one in their family had ever graduated from high school. And it wasn't because they uh, they had to go to work or whatever. They, they simply just disdained education. But there was one little boy in that great big family that got saved, that accepted the Lord Jesus Christ early on, and God called him to preach. God gave him a love of reading and study, and so he became the only one in his family to graduate from high school. He then went on to college, and he earned a bachelor's degree in Bible at Tennessee Temple University in Chattanooga, Tennessee. He then got a master's degree. Then he earned a master of theology degree. Uh, then he eventually went on to earn a Doctor of Theology, a Ph.D. degree. His East Tennessee family thought that he had wasted his time and his money on all that education. Then, uh, over time, he went into pastoral ministry. He, uh, he went into itinerant ministry, began to travel from church to church, and that's when I had an opportunity to hear him. And for the really the first time, I got a an understanding of what expositional preaching was all about, contextual expositional preaching. And I heard it really, I, I'd heard little snippets of sermons, but we I never knew that the books of the Bible were a con cohesive whole and that they had themes and that they had overall teachings as you went through entire books. And, and this is the way this individual uh, taught uh, in his conference ministry. And so I remember sitting through his ministry, and, um, and then he gave me a, a copy of his book called Building Steadfast Christians. By the way, uh, the author of that book was Dr. Delma Lowry. He is with the Lord now. But after I heard him preach and listened as he gave a study of the book of the Bible in its context and gave out the truth of Scripture, I thought to myself, I want to do what he does. And I decided to go to graduate school, largely because of the influence of that man. In fact, he was on staff at the graduate school uh, that I attended when I first started going for my master's degree. He had a profound influence on my life. Recently, my son, who was a chaplain in the Air Force, told me that he was using a book I had given him, and uh, he had mentioned who he had mentioned this particular gentleman, Dr. Delma Lowry, entitled Building Steadfast Christians, and that he was using Dr. Lowry's book to disciple uh, military men and women uh, for Jesus. Listen, what if when God had called Delma Lowry, what if he said, I'm from a poor family in East Tennessee. My family scorns education. I'm I am one, just one little guy among all these people in my family. What if he had said, I'm not equipped. I just can't do this. And I won't. But he didn't. He didn't do that. Because God had called him as his child to serve him and those whom God called he equips. He did not accept an identity that was put on him and that most of the people in his family followed to a T. He was who God said he was, 
and he followed God's will for his life. Dr. Lowry didn't do that. Friend, don't do that. Don't you do that either. You are who God says you are. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a child of God. Now, I'm, before we close, I want you to repeat that with me, would you? Here's the first thing. Repeat this. I am a child of God. Second thing. I am more than a conqueror. Third thing. I can do anything God calls and equips me to do. Believe that. It's true. You are who God says you are. You can do what he calls you.